Okay, so now for the final part, I hope we can finish this on time today, uh, would be to look at other channels except vision, audio, motion, which we already talked about. So these are the really uh, more outlandish things, I'd say, which still have been used for kind of interaction, input and output with mobile devices, stuff like finger fingerprints or uh, skin connectivity. Um, and here again, the question is, at what point does this stuff become too exotic for the user? At what point does it become too complicated? For example, if you remember the, the other example with the electrodes, uh, I probably wouldn't want to have to attach electrodes to my forearm every time I want to play a game. Um, and all of these are also kind of related. So one channel which is not quite um, uh, the same as motion would be a body stance, like so the, the way I stand, the way I hold my arms, or even the way I hold my fingers. Um, this, uh, on the one hand, one hand, this requires sort of a model of my, my skeleton, or at least of the, the major limbs, um, and it's also quite difficult to do something like this on a mobile device without having um, some kind of external sensor like the like the Kinect. There have been applications where you can detect the the, the body pose, the stance of the user by using many uh, of these MEMS sensors, accelerometers attached to to the joints uh, of the user. But then, of course, you would need to wear uh, I don't know. 14 different devices on your knees, on your ankles, on your wrists, on your elbows, and so on. And that would, of course, also be very cumbersome. So this is a channel which has been used for I.O., but it's uh, probably very difficult to do this in a, in a mobile context. So mostly, mostly here for completeness sake. Um, another one which might actually be used for mobile is grasp. So that, that describes how I how I hold an object. Uh, am I holding it with one hand, with the left one, with the right one? Um, and when I know a lot of how I hold an object, then I can actually infer a lot of things about, uh, about my relationship, my goals, uh, the context, the properties of the object, and so on. So especially regarding the goals. So for example, if you look at the screwdriver in the top image, that person will probably want to actually use it to tighten a screw. And in the center, uh, that person will probably want to hand the screwdriver over to someone else. So there's quite a difference here. And it is actually possible to detect the grasp of a, of a device on the device itself. So I might just imagine to cover the, the rim and the back of the device with additional touch sensors, basically, and then I could uh, more or less detect the, the hand shape on the device. And that's something which I could use afterwards to detect, for example, uh, so if I want to hand my phone over to someone else, then in theory I could detect that and switch the phone into some kind of guest mode where the other person can just uh, look up things on Google or use Google Maps, for example, if I just want to show someone uh, a location on the map. So this is not quite as, as far-fetched as uh, taking the entire body stance into account. Grasp might be something which you can actually detect on the device itself. <laughs> <clears throat> then facial expression, also a channel. Uh, again, a very complex computer vision problem. So usually works like this, that you assign different, uh, different control points to different parts of the user's face. And from the relation of the control points to each other, then you can infer the um, um, yeah, the, the mood or uh, the, also the context of the user. Problem here is again that uh, this is very much dependent on the user, so it needs some kind of training. Um, it, there has been one uh, sort of security related application. Um, modern Android phones usually come with a feature called face unlock where you can teach 
teach it your own face and then you just have to look at it and it will unlock. And the very first implementation of that just used a, a static picture. And I was working at Siemens at that time and the uh, first thing we tried was take a picture with a different phone of the guy owning the phone and then holding that in front of the uh, phone to be unlocked and that worked. So that wasn't too much of a security feature. Um, so the most current version actually uh, requires you to, to blink with one eye to prove that you're actually a live person. Um, but you could probably still fool that with a video. So um, it's not much of a security thing. It's also not much of facial recognition. But this is in theory something that's possible on a, a device. So you might be able to, for example, detect if the user is really stressed or uh, uh, relaxed and also adjust the, the uh, context accordingly, but not something which is, which is commonly used. Um, then we have eye tracking, gaze tracking. You've maybe also come in contact with that in, in other lectures. So in that, this example, uh, that woman is wearing dedicated gaze tracking glasses which are then used for uh, kind of user research usually. So to, to determine where on a picture people are, uh, are actually looking. Um, there are also some phones which do have an integrated gaze tracker. Um, that's usually a second infrared camera and an infrared light source which tries to detect the reflection in the pupils. And um, there has been some, actually I think some commercial devices, some Samsung phones again, which for example, if you're watching a video and you look somewhere else, then it will detect that your gaze has gone off the screen and it will pause the video. Um, but we already talked about this briefly related to touch. With touch, you always have the problem that you can't uh, not touch something without, uh, if you want to interact. And with gaze, there's the same problem. You just have to look at something if you want to interact. And you can't basically look away and still, uh, still detect what's on the screen. Um, what might be even more interesting is to take this uh, eye tracking data uh, to, again, infer some context about what state the user is in. So how, how quickly your eyes move and they do that involuntarily, or how large your pupils are gives you some information about, uh, for example, how excited or stressed uh, or so the user is. And maybe that even works more reliably than doing the face tracking and face detection we talked about earlier. Um, yeah, uh, I already mentioned that it's involuntary, so how, how quickly your eyes move and how often you blink, for example. Uh, some cars are trying to use that to detect how, uh, if, if the user is in danger of falling asleep, uh, if the driver, in that case the user is of course the driver, um, is close to falling asleep because he starts to blink more and more often and then it will warn you or wake you up in some way. So this is also, in the widest sense, some kind of mobile application of, of eye and gaze tracking. Okay, so um, what's left? Heart rate is one uh, channel which we can also use, again, to, to enforce some context about the user. Maybe uh, more relevant now that we have, like, often have smartwatches with built-in pulse sensors. There's also so-called pulse oximeters, which measure how much uh, oxygen is in your blood, which may or may not be relevant if you do lots of sports. Um, in fact, that's even possible just with the smartphone camera. Maybe some of you have come across an app uh, which does that, so you don't actually need a dedicated sensor. You just need the camera. Does anyone have an idea how that might work? Maybe you've uh, already used such an app, so you can actually detect the heart rate just with the camera. Yes? Yeah, it goes in the right direction. So anyone else has an idea? Well, these apps usually ask you to put your finger over the camera, exactly, and turn on the, the flash. And then 
you get, uh, depending on the blood pressure, you get a little more or a little less light transmitted from the flash into the camera. You, so mostly the camera is of course dark, the camera image, because your fingers on it, but you will get a little light leaking through your finger from the flash. Um, and that will change up and down depending on the blood pressure. And by looking at that, you can actually detect the pulse uh, uh, fairly accurately. Uh, the the built-in pulse sensors, for example, in a smartwatch work exactly the same way. They shine a light onto the, the skin and simply measure how much light gets, gets reflected and that simply changes very little, but uh, measurably with, which is, uh, with each pulse. Um, of course, then we're already getting, getting into uh, privacy territory again, so it might be uh, quite sensitive data actually. So if you have, for example, if you have a heart condition and your heart rate is higher than it should be uh, and suddenly you get a, uh, uh, an extra bill from your health insurance company because they've realized that you might have a, a heart attack in the next five years and so they're charging you double now. So it's not what's happening right now, but it's something that might be feasible at some point in the future. Actually, I've just read a few days ago that Google now has, uh, has access to all uh, health records in Britain for research and they're supposed to be anonymized, but uh, how well that works, uh, we'll, I guess we'll see. And if you can combine that with that sort of, uh, of data, then that might actually uh, bring up some privacy issues again. Um, Okay, so what's also kind of an I.O. channel is the fingerprint, of course. You can use that to unlock your phone in modern devices. You can use it to authorize uh, fin financial transactions, maybe. Um, it's mostly a separate device. Uh, you could actually consider uh, a scenario where you integrate a fingerprint sensor directly into the screen and across the whole screen. So the entire screen is at the same time a fingerprint sensor. Can you think of any additional features except security which that would get you? Yeah? Multi-user? Yeah, multi-user, definitely. So just the person which actually owns the device would be able to trigger th certain things. Um, yeah? Maybe instead of a signature, because <coughs> now when you, for example, have important documents, you often need to print it out and sign by yourself. Maybe instead of this, you could do mm -hmm. fingerprint Yeah, yeah, that's also a scenario. Like, yeah, triggering a digital signature, so to speak. What you could also do, that's something which is actually, I think, already sort of possible with the current fingerprint sensors. Um, that only needs better software support. If you had a fingerprint sensor across the entire screen, then you could, of course, also tell which finger you are actually using right now. Is it the uh, index? Is it the thumb? And then you can, in theory, again, switch to different, uh, different functions depending on what finger you use. Of course, that might not be such a good idea at some point because if you have a unimanual usage context, what you talked about earlier, then you can only use the thumb. And if you have some functions which actually would require your index finger, then you would have a problem because then you would ha have to switch to uh, your phone to the other hand first. Yeah. Um, it's actually very similar to the, um, to the capacitive touchscreen, which we talked about last week, just as a, at a much higher resolution. And then you can detect the individual fingerprints, uh, the, the, um, the uh, how is that called, ridges, I think, on the finger. Um, and that's basically also the main reason why that's not, uh, not yet available on the whole screen because then we would simply need a much higher uh, touch resolution uh, of, I don't know, 300 DPI or something. And right now it's only maybe 10 DPI or, or, or 50 perhaps. 
but it's far, uh, far too low to actually detect fingerprint. In fact, that's uh, an interesting point. So uh, you can't use the touch sensor on a current mobile device to de detect fingerprints. But what you can detect, that's the next example, uh, are ear prints. That's actually a, a research project from last year, which I find quite interesting. So this is basically an image of what the touch sensor sees. And in that project, they actually used this to detect the shape of the ear. And so only an authorized person, for example, can actually accept a phone call because only they have the right, the right ear shape. So uh, that works because the ear is much bigger than the fingerprint, but it's still quite unique for each, each person. And um, so you can kind of uh, misuse the touch screen to, uh, to authenticate the user based on, on the shape of their body parts. So also uh, like the, sh the shape of the flat hand, for example, you can detect that and then use some machine learning technique again to, to extract how the, um, yeah, how the, the, the shape basically is. So this isn't something which the touch screen supports uh, uh, normally because normally it would just give you uh, a, few, a few major touch points and ignore the rest. Uh, but if you access the, the actual hardware at a lower level, then you can extract this, this entire image basically of what's touching the screen and use that to, um, to extract additional information. Um, all right, so we're nearly done. So just five more minutes today. Um, one final aspect I'd like to mention is of course a brain computer interface. In theory, that would be the perfect interface. You can use it without using your hands. You don't have to, uh, to talk. Um, you don't have to look anywhere. So you can just think of what you want to happen and it happens. So that's science fiction. In, in reality, you can get brain computer interfaces, but they, are, they have a number of drawbacks. So you actually have to have electrodes on your head, similar problem as with the ones on your, uh, on your arm, of course. Uh, then you need a lot of practice to actually use it. So uh, heavily disabled people uh, sometimes use these now, but um, they need weeks of practice to actually just uh, control something properly in uh, like left and right. Just one single direction, left and right, already needs tons and tons of practice. And uh, even if you've had lots of practice, then it will, it, it's still quite error prone. So the general idea is great, but it's still a long way from being, from being actually usable. So you can buy brain computer interfaces for a few hundred uh, euros in the store. They usually look like the ones on the left. So they have a couple of, of flexible arms which contact your, your uh, your skull and which measure the, the really tiny currents your brain activity will trigger on the surface of your skin. But these ones, the consumer grade ones are currently uh, not usable for anything much beyond detecting some general state of, of mind, like is the user relaxed or is he focused? That's probably everything you can get reliably. There are some applications where you can, for example, control up, down, left, right, but again, this takes weeks of practice and isn't also isn't really reliable. So because these electrodes might, they need to, they need to be uh, wet, uh, so they might dry out, they might corrode. Even if it just moves a little on your head, you will already get quite different readings, so it's really difficult to use. So the, the ones that are sort of usable are the medical ones, but they really look like this. So you can imagine that they will take even, even longer to set up and uh, even they still need a lot of training. So uh, it might be at some point in the future feasible to actually use such an interface for using it while mobile because that's what we're talking about. And in theory, it would be perfect because you wouldn't need your hands anymore all of that what I already mentioned, but in practice, it's still a, a very long way from being usable. All right, so I think we're done for today. Are there any, any more questions, comments?
So I hope I didn't take too, too much extra time. Yeah, thanks for listening and see you in three weeks, I guess.